Buongiorno a tutti. My name is Emilia Linsky, and I'm a PhD candidate in Italian studies at Harvard University. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Remy Targoff, professor of English and co-chair of the Italian studies at Brandeis University. Today, we are here to discuss her latest publication, a biography of the 16th century Italian poet Vittoria Colonna, Renaissance woman. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. My first question is uh, related to the title, Renaissance Woman. What is a Renaissance woman? And uh, for people who might not know Vittoria Colonna, how did she embody these ideals? I think I chose the title partially just as a pun on the idea of the Renaissance man, um, but also because if you think about the different aspects of the Renaissance that we consider crucial to what made that a special moment in history, the arts, the flourishing of the arts, the religious transformations, all of the painting, poetry, political life, really almost every aspect of what we think of of the Renaissance, Vittoria Colonna was oddly centrally connected. So when Burkhardt, the famous 19th century uh, Swiss historian, is describing the flourishing of, of the Renaissance and comes up with the whole idea of the sort of Renaissance man, in effect. Uh, he says that Vittoria Colonna was the most famous woman of Renaissance Italy. And I think there's really no aspect of 16th century Italian life that she didn't have some kind of impact on or engagement with. So she's a sort of embodiment in many, many ways of the period. Um, is there a difference between a Renaissance woman and a Renaissance man? I assume so. I haven't thought about the gender differences, but you know, obviously her life in the public sphere was, was much more curtailed. Um, on the other hand, she was very engaged in diplomacy and political negotiations because her family was so powerful and her brother was so volatile and unreliable. People didn't want to work with him. She ended up being the representative of the Colonna family, and the Colonna family is one of the most important families of the era. So in that respect, I mean, to say she, she certainly didn't fulfill all of, the, all of the roles of the Renaissance man, if we think about Castiglione's definition of what you know, a Renaissance courtier should do. She's definitely in the female side of that. Um, but she did engage more with political figures. She was in regular contact with multiple popes, with Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. And there's one moment in particular, I think it's in 1541, when the pope is about to launch an attack on her brother, and it, this leads to what's known as the Salt War, and it was a big political fiasco. Um, but the pope has uh, assembled a congress in Germany, I think it's in Regensburg, and they're not sure what to do, and they say, ask Vittoria, like she's the one they want to go to, to help resolve this problem. She actually wasn't able to resolve it. But in that sense, she's fulfilling a lot of the primary roles that we would have associated with men. Um, speaking more about Vittoria Colonna as a person and referencing the Bricardian thesis of the individual in that the Renaissance was, was when we had this, the birth of the modern conception of yes. the individual, it's, a, it's very tempting to think of these historical figures as actual people that we know and to converse with them on a personal level uh, as Machiavelli did with, with his dialogues with the ancients. Uh, and particularly with a person like Vittoria, who has so many emotional poems and emotional letters, I, I think it would be very tempting, and, and we would like to be able to converse with her yes. as a person. So what kind of person did, did you discover, and were you able to establish this kind of dialogue through your archival work? It's a really interesting question. Whenever we're working on the past, we enter into imaginary <laughs> conversations. Petrarch says, you know, that's his best company when he's sitting, that he likes to talk to Cicero and Seneca. Um, I would say that my impression of Vittoria Colonna changed over the course of writing the book. The initial sense I had was of a very devout, austere, somewhat severe, elegant human being. That remained more or less true. But it got complicated in, in, in positive and interesting ways. I discovered, for example, that she was kind of funny. I don't know if you saw that, that she had a, she had a very wry sense of humor, which I didn't expect. 
She also had moments of sort of weird expressions of, you know, I'm thinking about when she decides to learn a dance, a Hungarian dance, and dances it apparently in front of hundreds of people at a wedding, which we wouldn't have associated with this woman who's sort of self-fashioned as a nun by the end of her life. She also has funny moments, for example, in her conversations with Michelangelo, where she's bossy or irreverent. And so the the person that I came to imagine as Vittoria Colonna was, was a little bit unpredictable, um, was not just this sort of anti-type to Lucrezia Borgia, which is how people in the popular imagination tend to think about her. At the same time, she was also more tragic than I had imagined. I had no idea that she spent the last, you know, seven, eight years of her life in a really unsatisfied, romantic, I don't know how erotic to make it, but she was in love with Reginald Pohl. That became very clear to me. And he didn't love her back, as he says very poignantly in one of one of his letters, his last letter to her. So she also took on a more tragic uh, dimension rather than the sort of consummate widow who just, you know, cut herself off from any erotic experience. She she had um, a real love at the end of her life that was unfulfilled. Speaking of love and, and of these sig very significant relationships with these important figures in her life, um, it's uh, tempting to think of her as defined by her relationships with these men, yes. with her husband, with Michelangelo, with Paul, with God. Um, and it might seem from your framing of the book, of, of, her, of the events of her life in the book, that this is how we should see her and interpret her. Um, you uh, start with the death of her husband, then flash back to the engagement, and then proceed from there. So what went into your decision to uh, frame her chronology in this way? Well, I would say there's so little about her life that we know from before her marriage, almost nothing. And then even during her marriage, we have a much scantier archive than afterwards. I didn't want to write a sort of cradle to grave biography. Um, I wanted to begin where things took off, I would say. And the moment that she became a widow, however sad and tragic that was for her, was actually the blossoming of this human being. She started writing poetry. She started traveling. She had a full life independent of you know, her husband, and because she was financially independent, she was also able to make lots of decisions. Most of her life, she was actually, her widowhood, she was actually making decisions for herself about where she was going to live, who she wanted to be with. There are only a couple occasions where things happen, usually involving her family, where she's forced to take refuge uh, in one of the family homes. But so I wanted to, I wanted to launch her, rather than start with the childhood that we can kind of conjure up from hints here and there, but I wanted to launch her into the world when she became the person that we're interested in, basically. Speaking of, uh, well, we're interested in her mainly because of her poetry, <clears throat> um, as, even though she had so many other interesting contributions to all aspects yes. of life. Uh, and in fact, she was the first female poet, as you say, to be printed in a single author book of poetry. But this happened against her wishes. Uh, this quote from Piero Gallo, the editor of that edition, uh, particularly struck me. I consider it less of an error to displease one woman, however rare and great, than to deny so many men what they want. You write that this sounded a provocative note on the grounds of both class and gender. Piero Gallo was laying hold of a precious and protected commodity and sharing with the masses. So I want to explore this idea a little further. What are we, the historians and readers, provoked to think? Uh, can we consider ourselves justly provoked? It's an interesting question. You know, the the striking gender, gendering of that, um, imagining a male audience, for example, goes against lots of what we know about her readership during the period, which was that women were reading her, women were inspired by her. Um, she became really a role model for several generations of women poets after her. So the the sort of titillation that he seems to be getting at, I, I understand as a marketing strategy rather than something that corresponded uh, in reality. It's also the case that, as, as you know, although she 
did not authorize the publication of her poems, she never took the steps that she could have done to stop it. And so in the decade after the first edition of her poems was published, that was in 1538, she died nine years later. In those nine years, 12 editions of her poems appeared in print. She was a very powerful person with lots of people owing her favors, wanting to help her. It is absolutely out of the question that she couldn't have stopped the press that she really wanted to. Um, so I take her protest, her, her non-authorization as a gesture, probably a gesture of indifference rather than of hidden ambition. Um, I think what she says about the publication of the poems, which is, you know, well, I shouldn't have wasted my time on these, on these vain things, that's her language, is probably correct. She had moved on, by the time the poems were published, she had moved on from writing love sonnets and was only writing spiritual poems. So I do think she had a sense that this was sort of the punishment she deserved for, for bothering with these, with these trifles, as she puts it. I don't, I don't think that she was suffering from the publication of her poems. I see no sign of that in all of her correspondence, of which there are hundreds of letters from the moment the, the publication of the poems through the end of their death. She never says that she's suffering in any way, that she regrets that this has happened. So the lack of all of those signs suggests to me that this was, this was something she quietly accepted, at least. And speaking of her poetry, uh, we'd be remiss if we did not reference in particular <laughs> any one of her poems. So I've asked you to bring a favorite poem of hers that you discovered today. Uh, would, would you like to share it? Yes, I have it with me. And I should say um, that one thing that ended up happening from writing the book was there's no translation of most of her poems into English. We have a translation of her spiritual sonnets, which uh, my colleague Abigail Brundin, a professor at the University of Cambridge, published around 15 years ago, a beautiful edition called Sonnets for Michelangelo. Those are the 103 poems that she gave to Michelangelo. No one has ever published uh, her, what we call her amorous poems, the poems that she wrote after her husband's death. So my editor for this book, wanted me to do my own translations for anything I mentioned cited in the book. And that was probably around 20 to 30 poems. But once I got going, I found it really uh, fascinating to work on these poems just as, as literary texts. So just in the last week, I actually finished my translation of the 1538 sonnets. Um, so I translated 143 poems, and it will be published by University of Toronto Press and the other voices. So this, what I'm going to read to you, is poem 18 in that book, and this is my translation. Love wrapped me in so noble a flame that even once spent, it continues to burn. Nor do I fear new fire, since the first is so strong it extinguishes all others. So rich a bond ties me to that fine yoke that my heart disdains all lesser chains. It feels no longer either hope or fear, since one fire burnt it, one knot bound it tight. A single pungent arrow afflicts my breast so that it keeps alive the immortal wound and shields all other love from entering. Love consumed the passion where once he lit it. He broke the bow with his enduring shot. He melted all other knots in tying this one. Thank you so much. Um, were there any problems in translation that you encountered that you could uh, speak about? I wouldn't say there were problems particular to her, but the challenge that I created for myself was that I decided to write English sonnets. So in other words, I didn't create little prose paragraphs, but I don't know if that came out, but that's in roughly an iambic pentameter. So I decided to write blank verse English sonnets so that the poems would sound like poems. And the constriction to 10, line, 10 beats per line put a certain kind of pressure on everything. And I discovered, of course, that uh, you know, Italian has a totally different rhythm and different, you know, and we think of Italian as actually taking up a lot more room, but I actually found very often the opposite. For example, bello or bell, which is often, 
is has to be beautiful as three syllables off into one bell. So I was constantly trying to find, you know, fine, fair, pure, you know, try to find ways to get around these very, these, these adjectives or nouns in Italian that, that are very, um, do a lot of work in a concise way, which English didn't, didn't actually have. So there were, there were moments of negotiation. I wanted to stay as close as I could. The translations were, uh, are, are quite faithful. It was, it was just so interesting to get that close to her. I noticed, for example, in that poem I just read, she uses the metaphor of the knot, of the nodo. And that nodo comes up all the time to describe her bond to this husband of hers who's dead and who treated her terribly. And yet she can't get out of it. And so there were sort of lots and lots of metaphors to describe what it felt like to be erotically stuck in this bond to someone who had died. And although I was aware of that before translating the poems, I hadn't realized the plethora of ways to describe that. It just kept coming up again and again. Indeed, I really enjoyed um, the selection of translated poems that you include in the biography. Oh, and uh, I think we're all looking forward to the edition of her poems. Yeah, I mean, it will be, it will be I think, useful to read because what I decided to do was to translate the 1538 edition. So I translated the entire uh, first publication of Vittoria Colonna, including all the mistakes. So including, I think there are seven poems that she, it turns out, didn't write, but they're in there anyway. Lots of poems that ultimately got corrected. But as a historical artifact, I wanted to give readers like Pirgallo, I wanted to give them uh, just modern readers what it would have felt like to encounter this landmark publication, which was, you know, incredibly successful, however many mistakes there were. And so with that to look forward to, a new edition of Vittoria Colonna's first edition, Mistakes and All, I think we can conclude the interview. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for joining us today.